Okay. So we just want to open that window. And there we go. Okay, so um, who says you don't learn things? I think I have had four different ways to teach a class so far this semester. Uh, I don't remember if I used this computer to link to the pedestal this way in this class before. We're always learning, there's always new technology. You get an email or a communication pretty much every week asking, will you connect with somebody in a new way, in a new platform, in new software? But I still receive and send postcards. People laugh at that, but you know what? It's kind of nice, it's kind of different. Um, that's not connected to our theme today. That's just an observation. All right, so let me And the first thing I want to do is to point out that I uploaded three articles in this day's class and you didn't have to print them out. I asked you to read or at least skim one. Well, it happens that I printed out uh, much of three. I mean, I didn't print out the, the very back with the notes and I printed on a half page. That's just for my notes in case you have an article and you're following it. This is not my key point. If you're reading a PDF file that like I sent you, you have a lot of choices. And if you have a lot of money, then you can use Adobe Acrobat and that's the gold standard, the gold standard. That's normal. If you don't have a lot of money, there's a lot of free programs. I like this one because you can make lots of notes. You can make notes with your finger and a pencil, you know, or you can type in notes. When I'm working with other people and we're sharing documents and marking up documents, we often use this. I offer it to you. You don't have to use it. I do not know if it works on iPad. I don't know. It's a resource. Use it or don't. Today I put up a note about next week. Next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are national holidays in Korea. That's cool. And I know a few students who will not come to school on Thursday or Friday because they want to change their Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, five-day holiday into a nine-day holiday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They're just not coming to school. If they don't live in Daegu, they don't come to Daegu. So I'm being practical. And I'm making a recording, record a lecture for you to watch. Now, I'll get used to this. Look here. I'm changing, I'm changing. September 23rd is the Thursday following the five-day holiday. I will record a lecture for that day. Haven't done it yet. We'll do it this week. You should watch the lecture by September 30th. That's the following week, Thursday. The CTL uh, system, this eboard, you click on it to watch the video. If you watch the whole video, it will give me a green sign or a blue sign or something that says that you're done. If you don't watch the whole thing, you'll get an incomplete. Let's just do it this way, it's easier.
this point. Again, I'm not grading this one. I don't care if you want to. But you'll see something like this over here. Either root three or root four. If it shows it in two weeks, we'll just read the title. I don't think you see the blue, orange, and gray lines. How many bobeans watch the lecture? Okay. Question so far? No questions? Cool, easy. Um, Chun Yang, please open the chat box and type hello. That's my record that you're here. Everybody else is here. So today we're talking about democratization. And some people talk about Asian style democracy. That's kind of the theme today. before we talk too much about Korea, let's talk about Asia. The theme is that Asian values, whatever they are, somehow affect the concept of democracy, that democracy in Asia should be different than democracy in Europe or America or Australia. And Westerners very often will talk about Asian style democracy without noticing that even in Europe, there are different flavors of democracy. That democracy in Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark in general, the concept there is different than democracy in the UK is different than the concept of democracy in Italy, Spain, France and is different than the concept of democracy in the US. And we could say that the concept of democracy in the US varies, not strictly by politics, not strictly by geography, but that's part of it. Conservative, political and social conservatives tend to think that Government should be small, government should be limited, but there are certain things government should do. And liberals in America tend to think that government should take care of us, that government has a broader responsibility and that government should prevent people from doing some things. These are very broad strokes. Yet these people who don't separate between different kinds of democracy or different thinking of democracy in their own lands, in their own broader cultures, will turn around and say, yeah, but Asian culture, but Asian democracy. So it's not really fair. It's not really fair. But that's the theme. And since we're speaking in English and dealing with uh, Western approach in many ways, We'll attack this question today. So I, I said, you should read one of these, at least skim it, at least try. And I don't care which one you choose. All three are up here. I'm gonna summarize and discuss the three, but I'm also gonna encourage you to talk. In one of the three, and I'm not gonna say this one yet, this idea comes up. I mentioned it last class. Delegative democracy, to delegate democracy. A little bit different concept. But the guy who invented the word or, or put together the phrase, even he says, well, I'm not sure what it is, but it's more like this instead of mm, more like that. 
But exactly what it is, not sure. But he suggests it's a kind of democracy that's a little bit different. Democracy or polyarchy. Now, poly means many. Archy is referring to basically government or ways that people decide things. In this case, okay. not a single authority, that would be autocracy. Right? Or a very few that control everything, that would be autocracy. But uh, many levels of decision making in one polyarchy. Democracy or polyarchy that differs from this concept that Westerners think they know, representative bureaucracy, a representative democracy. Rather than featuring institutionalization, and we're going to talk about that word a little bit, the primacy of law and negotiations. Okay, so institutionalization means that we build a structure, we build a government, we build courts, and they are not people. Yes, people run them, but the institution lasts longer than any one person. One judge dies, another judge comes in. Their feelings might be different, but the system, the concept, the courts continue. And they pretty much kind of sort of follow what came before. Maybe not perfect. There can be changes, but they're slow and gentle. So institution refers to not personal, but a system. Institutionalization, primacy of law, that means law over people. That means you did something bad. I don't care about your reasons. You did bad. Okay. Law is more important than people. If you are rich and powerful, the law still applies. Doesn't matter. We don't care if you're rich. We don't care if you're the president. If you broke the law, you broke the law. Now, this is a concept that we believe it doesn't mean it always happens. Sometimes it doesn't. But we believe that institution over person, law over person. And we can't read that because it's too high. Compromise among interest groups. Interest groups, people who have a feeling or a want. That we don't just fight and the majority wins. You know, the guy with the more votes wins, the guy with the bigger guns wins. But instead we talk and we hope we can find some kind of middle, something that's not too horrible for you, but mostly I win because I have more votes. And so we, we're looking at compromise over victory. That the losers don't lose too bad. Compromise among interest groups, groups of have, that have a particular want. Which, right? So delegative democracy is kind of the reverse, where they give the president, the prime minister, a winner, all the powers of a super leader, all the powers of a king, all the powers of the general who conquers the country, all the prerogatives and, and accountability. So not only do I get the freedom to make the choices, but when things go wrong, you blame me. It's not a system problem. It's not, well, the economy was bad. No, you're the president. It's your fault. If it's bad, it's your fault. If it's good, you get the glory. Okay, so it's kind of the opposite of this middling, don't blame any one person system approach. This is, it's all about you. You won, you get the power, you get the glory, you get the blame. Unquote. All right, this actually came out of one of our three papers, too. but it's probably the key theme for today. So if you haven't written it down, write it some more convenient. Now, as I said, I, I happen to print out the three articles 
And the things I'm going to talk about, I actually circled, but I also made my notes here. Okay. Now, classic old school Western teaching approach. No, I'm not going to give you my notes. It's up to you. Take the notes. It's very probable, almost certain, that today's class subject will be one of your questions on one of your tests in the term of fact. Almost certain. That much I can tell you. Usually my tests give you some choices. Some of the test is multiple choice, you know, check the box. I don't usually do true and false. But some of my tests are, here's three questions, answer two. So you can skip one. I try to be, I try to let you focus on things you want to focus. But I am telling you, today's topic, this theme of delegative democracy is one of the elements on the test. The way I do it. All right. So we had three readings today, and I'm going to start with um, not that one. With Kim Sung Su. If you read it, if you didn't, that's okay. And the reason I'm going to do this one first is I actually dig more. Okay. I actually dig more from this one than from the other two because it's broader. It gives more background information. And it's written more like a book chapter or a lecture. Now, as it happens, this particular computer defaults to the web stream. Come on, come on, where are you? I don't remember where you are. Oh, I don't use this computer enough. Oh, of course, it's right here. Okay, so it's kind of, oh, by the way, this was published in a Korean journal, so you'll find some Korean stuff every now and then. Don't care about it. The evolution of Korean political culture, is it compatible with the virtues of democracy? Now here we're giving this, this great uh, Greek classic definition of democracy, the virtues of democracy, only democracy is good, everything else is bad. Uh, don't worry, I don't believe that. So on the very first page of the article is one of my first areas of discussion because it's right at the top of the thing. The theme here is that there is a continuity of political culture. That means political culture doesn't just come from nowhere. Political culture has a history. The political culture of Korea in the 21st century is connected to the Korean political culture of 1980, of 1940, of 1840, of 1340. That history affects choices today. And it just starts on that page and runs down to the next page. So let me read it as I've got it. There is a continuity of political culture, that's the first page, handed down from generation to generation. You okay? Yes. Was that your knee or the table? That was the table. Okay, don't break my table. <laughs> there's, a, there's a continuity of political culture handed down from generation to generation in the process of socialization and education. That means you learn your politics from your father and mother from your grandparents, from your cousins, and, and from the neighborhood. But it, it is a process, it's not new invented. Because we believe in that, under that assumption, social and economic change 
social mobilization moving from rich to poor or whatever, and specialization, institutional practices in government, and historical experience all modify and transform political values. So America today is what it is because of what America did 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And you can't just take that system and drop it in a new country because in every country, it's gonna be based on its past. So in China, you know, the Great March impacts China today. Korea did not have a great march. United States did not have a great march. So it's going to be different. That's the first concept. If you believe that, then you understand that democracy in one country can never be the same democracy in a different country. People value different things. A little bit lower on this page, he quotes other people, according to Lee. So one Korean scholar said that Korean political culture can be identified with almost 40 basic characteristics. Okay, that's crazy. If you have 40 characteristics, you have none. It's a mess, it's confusing. So this scholar, Kim, said, well, there's seven that are actually important. Let's talk about seven key points or most typical characteristics in Korea. Authoritarianism. I'm the boss. Civic orientation. People believe that they need to worry about the people around them society around them. Civic, in this case, means like city or town or neighborhood. So, um, some people stretch it to the country level. I'm not sure that's true. But, but one of the seven basic is that people don't just worry about themselves and their family. That's controversial. Many people in Korea don't think so. Collectivism. I use the word communitarianism. It means that we all work together for common good. Okay? It can mean we invest together. It can mean that we support each other. I'll help you on your farm and you help me on my farm. Okay? We understand that we don't even have to say it. It's just normal, the sense of working together. Okay, that's one small step from communism with a small c. Okay. But we're not going quite that far. Small c, not political communism, but social communism. Communitarianism or collectivism is a little bit short of that. Okay, so here he defines it as an orientation like a family orientation, feminism, stressing the collective, the group, over the individual. Uh, in this class before, I said the word uri. That's the Korean word to refer to we or us, this sense of a shared identity. Whereas in English, we tend to use the word I and me in every sentence, or almost, you know, I say my mother, a Korean says our mother, because she is the mother in our family. Mm, alienation, I'm only alone. This seems like an opposite. But in this case, alienation often refers to, you know, our Korea is so poor, the rest of the world hates us. So there's this sense of we have to be together because everybody's against us. Factionalism, my team is not your team. Propensity to resistance. People tend to fight. People tend to argue against things they don't like. They don't just say, ah, okay. So in Korea, you'll see there's lots of demonstrations. Uh, the subways are probably going on strike this week. 
Yeah. In some countries, subways, because they're like a government worker, not exactly, but like a government, it's a government company, it's illegal to strike. But in Korea, they strike. And national identity. Most countries have a sense of, you know, we are American, we are Korean. So I'm not sure exactly how important it is, but this becomes the theme of this paper. That there's seven things that we can point to and say, this is Korean. Some countries have less nationalism than others. Next paragraph down says, so what are the roots of Korean political culture? Well, in all three of these papers, we learned that Korea is multi-religious. We've got the Confucianist, which is not even exactly a religion. We've got Buddhists. We've got Catholics and Protestants who in Korea tend to conflict more. In other countries, much less. But in Korea, if you say you're Christian, it means you are not Catholic. It means you're not Catholic. Catholics are Christians, of course. But if you say you are Christian, it means you are not Catholic. So I happen to be Catholic. I was raised that way, right? So when, uh, I will tell somebody I'm Christian. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say, oh, no, 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 I'm Catholic. But, so suddenly they thought I was part of us, and suddenly I'm not, because Catholics are not Christians in the Korean mindset. So we got Buddhist, Protestant, Roman Catholic, shamanic, shaman, and Confucian. Uh, shamanism is the indigenous belief, like you know, God is in the trees and he speaks through the wind. And you see anybody bowing before a pig's head, the head of a pig, that's a shamanistic tradition in Korea. And most people, including Christians and Catholics, uh, keep a little piece of all of these different traditions in them somehow. Okay. But anyway, these various communities are found together. It's not like some countries where the Christians live here and the, and the, the Jews live here and the Arabs live here or the, the Muslims live here. No, they, they live side by side, next door to next door. So they can live together. They just know they're different. They're found together and overlap, none of them being dominant or prominent, right? Uh, we have had Protestant presidents in Korea, we have had Buddhist presidents in Korea, we have had Catholic presidents in Korea. Uh, nobody has claimed to be shamanist and everybody is Confucian to some degree. None of them being prominent in terms of population and degree of social political influence. Right? Uh, yeah, there's more Protestants than Catholics. There are more Protestants and Catholics together then there are Buddhists, maybe. It depends which day. If I ask you today, what's your religion? You might say I'm Buddhist. I ask the same person tomorrow, they might say I'm Christian. Because a lot of people are kind of there. My wife is a perfect example. Right? My wife's a perfect example. In any given month, she could go to three different places. She could go to a Christian church. She could go to a Buddhist temple. And she could go to a Confucian shrine. That's, that's Korea. Okay, then it goes on and talks about the Gallup poll and who chooses for it. Now we're going to jump through a few pages. Mm. It's page 105 if you're following me there. Where's my page numbers? Now, there will be other days when I will make a PowerPoint to show things off, but this particular class each year, I work from this book, uh, page 105 on the bottom. Yeah. So the usual argument that people raise is Asian style democracy is based on Confucianism 
because Confucianism is basically only in East Asia. From Vietnam to Korea. There's hardly anybody in Russia who's Confucian. And those who are, are probably ethnic Korean. Uh, Confucianism does not have a strong impact in Japan, but a little bit. But basically, Korea, China, Taiwan, Vietnam. That's really what we're talking about. And China, because the, uh, the political processes from 1949 to 1980, they have eliminated much of the Confucian practices and thought. The, the, the party thought has taken over a lot of what was Confucian thought. At least that's what the scholars say. Now, what's deep in the heart of Chinese is a different question. When they become 87 years old and on their deathbed, are they thinking party or are they thinking Confucian? You'll have to ask them. And, and maybe some of our students will have some ideas. Uh, but anyway, Korea is typically called Neo-Confucius, N-E-O Confucius, which means modified, not the traditional original. And Taiwan is also considered Neo-Confucius, but a little bit different. The, it's a different kind of Neo, it's a different adjustment. Those are the only two countries nowadays in the world that are typically called Confucius or Neo-Confucius. Uh, Vietnam, like China, has gone into a communist socialist approach, and much of the old Confucius ideals have been kind of erased. So many people believe that Confucianism was a status quo oriented system. Confucianism said what your father was is what you are. If you are a farmer, you will probably be a farmer. And if you're a farmer, then you should respect the king. Okay? And your grandchild will probably be a farmer. And basically, the only way to escape is to pass the government employee test. It's hard to pass the government employee test. It's hard to study when you have to work in the field every day. So it's pretty much a status quo system. And I, my class is not about teaching Confucianism. If you want to learn that, grab a book, take a class. Uh, but my class is not about Confucianism. I'm just referring to it as part of what we know of government today. So many people believe that Confucianism was a status quo system rather than a system of change. And that Modernization, say Korea 1960 to present, changed all that. Is that really true? Did Confucianism get weaker when modernization came to Korea? Uh, lots of scholars argue that. And that's part of what these three papers talk about. How important is Confucianism today? How much has modernization weakened the classic relationships, social relationships, political relationships, economic relationships. Okay? So uh, this study goes on to say, well, that's, that's questionable based on the different ways that different countries have responded to modernization and they blah, 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 but I don't think we need to talk about too much. Beyond, uh, let me go down just one step. Confucian emphasis on family, group, norms, social harmony, and moral, political, and economic order. Okay, stability, status quo. Worry about your family. Some people have suggested that that blocks democracy. If democracy requires people with a broad social perspective, not a family perspective, that democracy says, I have the right to change. I can become rich. I can be, everybody can be, become president. 
That's the opposite of the social stability, political stability that Confucianism promoted. However, and this is one particular uh, Chinese scholar. One particular scholar says, well, Confucianism is not that far from democracy. Confucianism says we should be benevolent. We should be kind. We should care for the people around us. And our government should be benevolent. The king and the government should be kind caretakers. Like when you send your baby to the child care. You expect them to nurture and care for the child, right? not assault the child. That rich people have an obligation to poor. Uh, high ranking people have an obligation to the low ranking, which in English we use the French word noblesse oblige. Okay? You have an obligation to act in a proper, style towards people who are less fortunate. Okay. And Confucianism says at some point, if the king, if government does not meet their obligations, if the government does not do what they're supposed to do, then people have a right to revolt. People have a right to get rid of that government and put in a proper government, but only at the end of the road. There's no middle. It's like, okay, 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 you're dead. Okay? There's no middle ground. Do we agree with that? Uh, I don't know. In a nutshell, this scholar suggests that Confucianism this space. What happens? Can I say it? Page 106, yeah, that's page. No, it's up there. How come I how come I lost it? Ah, okay, there we go. Unlike uh, feudal Japan and the three dynasty period of China. In Korea, in the Joseon period from 1000 AD to 2000 AD, roughly, there was no political decentralization. There was only one government. There was only one king. China broke into three or 333, if you want to think that way, local governments that just roughly loosely obeyed the emperor Japan had all the little local warlords that fought and fought and fought and fought until 1860 something when they unified. But Korea has been unified throughout the Joseon period. And, and perhaps you could say since 600 AD when Tongshala basically settled. So Korea doesn't have a history of divided politics. Divided people but not divided politics. There's always been one king, one big boss. And that's how the system works in Korea. What that means is that we're giving the leader a lot of power. Nobody contests, nobody challenges the leader. So this author suggests that Confucianism is tolerant. They will accept a lot of weak points that we should trust each other and we should be trustworthy. I should be someone you can trust and I should trust you. I should respect you. Now in Korea, you will often hear the word deference. Deference is a form of respect. Deference says, for whatever reason, you have more authority to me and I respect that. 
So you will hear the word my senior in Korean a lot. He's my senior. How does that mean senior? Well, in school, it means he entered school before me. In the military, it if we're low ranking, it means he entered the military before me. But as we go up, then it means the person with the more stripes or the more pins or whatever, right? The higher ranking official, he's senior to me. In business, same rules. If we came in at the same time, we're all equal. Whoever came earlier is senior. But at some point, as you start to go up the ladder, then it comes to who has the higher office. So I should obey the senior. At the other side of that, the, the flip of that coin, the senior has obligations. So if I am a fourth year university student and you are a third year university student and we go out to eat together, I should pay. Or at least, at the very least, I should pay a lot more than you. I should pay half. Depends exactly the rank and, and our own local culture and schools are changing a little. But basically, if you're senior, it's your obligation to pay. But it's your obligation, you're junior, you have the obligation to follow me. So if I say, we're going to go eat some gipsal, then that's reading. Not just because I'm paying, but because I'm senior, I have the responsibility to make good decisions. And you have the responsibility to follow me until it is proven that I'm not worth following. So you can definitely know that I'm no good. So we have this very much rank system. And that includes in the family. Father is the boss. In school, they used to say a student dare not even step on the shadow of a teacher. That's how much difference the teacher got. Not, it wasn't a question of closeness. It was just the idea that a shadow is a representation of the teacher. So stay clear. So this deference, you know, king, father, husband, had power. Husband had power over wife. Father had power over children. King had power over everybody. And ladies, bad news. The last step. When the husband dies, the firstborn son has authority over the mom. Women, you will never have power in a Confucian system. That's, that's just the way it works. So deference is recognizing the relationship. And we could say obeying the relationship, following the relationship. So if you're my senior, I defer to you. I offer deference. And if we look at that and we look at Korean politics, then we can understand that deference is a part of the whole thing. But somehow or another, and it varies, but somehow or another, somebody is regarded as the chief, the boss of this faction, not a party. I mean, ultimately a party, but a party could have eight or 10 separate groups that are battling for power. But each of those groups has a chief. And one of those chiefs will become party leader. So if you look in politics right now in Korea, they are preparing for presidential elections next year. There's two main parties. Each of those parties has many factions, but right now each party has two people that are kind of recognized as probably going to be the leader of the party, going to be the presidential candidate. One of these two is probably going to be the presidential candidate. One of these two is probably going to be the presidential candidate. Probably three months ago, there were more, more factions, but kind of, okay, this guy's kind of been knocked out. This guy's kind of knocked out. Read the paper almost every day. Korea Herald, Korea Times, Juman Daily, uh, Young Hat, whatever paper you read, almost every day, you'll find articles that are talking about the political front runners. And in the 
PPP in our right here, it won't be on the display. In the PPP, don't even worry about names because they change like you change your clothes. In the PPP, the Conservative Party, the two leaders right now are Home, who's probably number two, but rising, and Yoon, who's probably number one, but falling. I mean, in terms of when they do surveys and they ask people who you like, inside the party, Hong has been around forever. He's one of these guys that I particularly dislike in Korean politics. That's my politics. My wife, on the other hand, has almost perfectly opposite politics to me, which is funny because in my mom's house, my mother and father are opposite parties. They vote, they, they joke about they cancel each other's ballot. They vote almost perfectly opposite every time. But in most American households, that's okay. I think nowadays, it's, it doesn't become a deep issue. But in Korea, if a woman thinks different than her husband, she will say it because she has to give birth to her husband. She can vote the way she wants, but she won't talk. So in, in this party, we could talk about Hong is rising, Hong Jin Kyo, and Yoon, I forget his name, is relatively new to politics. He was the prosecutor general in the country, and he's making a lot of, you could say, political mistakes, things that experienced politicians probably wouldn't make that mistake. I, I'm not telling you who I like or don't like. I, I'm not even you know, particularly a fan of this party, but this was in the paper today, for example. All right, so that's part of this deference about, finally, we have these different cliques, these different sections of the party, and each has their own little leader, and we defer to him until he does so badly that we kick him out of his bills. And then these groups, these cliques battle to find out who's going to be the top of the party. So we'll have next spring, we'll probably have seven or eight president candidates. Each party will bring in one. Well, there's only two parties that are main, that have a real chance of winning. But out of those two, whoever's the leader of one of those two is almost certainly going to be the president. It has never happened that a third party won for president in Korea or in the US. All right, so that's pretty much this first paper, the most important elements of it, and it is the best introductory paper. Uh, there's a little bit on the very end, which I'm just gonna summarize. It says, post-Confucian society. Okay, so we talked about Confucian society, Confucian society. We talked about Neo-Confucian, kind of sort of like Confucian, a little modified. Post-Confucian is when we say, well, Confucianism still has much influence, but uh, in general, the society has modernized much and it's not so significant. Here's the phrase, it's on page 114. Post-Confucian society is a society incorporating a modernization process in which traditional Confucianism, stressing authority and hierarchical relations, once dominated but has become less important. I think we're just, whoop, that's too far. No, yes, 48. Oh, yeah. Not yet. Holy smokes. 13, 14. So that's your sentence. Post Confucian. Now, a, a lot of people don't use that phrase. I, I won't say that's a mainstream concept. Post Confucian. Most people still call Korea Confucian. And the last element of this reading. Korean society has been characterized by increasing diversity. We mentioned that before. And that includes foreigners in Korea. 
different political orientations. Koreans are not inclined to maintain the status quo. They're not inclined to maintain these so-called Asian values that Lee Kuan Yew talked about. Lee Kuan Yew is the former prime minister of Singapore. He was the prime minister from its founding in 1960 until he retired in 1980, 78, something like that, at which time power went to his designated assistant for about eight years, and then it went to Lee Kuan Yew's son, who's the current prime minister. But uh, that's an argument. He was the loudest speaker. Uh, Matatir in Malaysia has said the same thing that foreigners, Westerners, should not be telling Asians about democracy. We have a different tradition, we have a different style of democracy. Anyway, that is the article that I thought was the more broad, the more uh, useful of the three. The least useful of the three, I thought, was the Anjong Che article, which I don't think I can go backwards here. I have to go here. Yeah. The Anjong Che article, we can do really fast. Uh, Confucian legacies. Did I write the name down? Somehow I got it wrong, but whatever. Three, two, one. That's just the, the cover for the electronic database where I got the file. Don't worry about it at all. And it calls it an article, but it's formatted more like a book chapter. But this is written like a research article. So the first thing I showed you, as I said, it's more like a book chapter or a lecture. It's broader. The next two articles, if you read one of them, are much more like traditional empirical research articles. We go out and we collect data. And we crunch the data. We put it in SPSS or some quantitative uh, analytic design, and we come up with numbers and we can say things like 33% of the people who think this also think that. Because I read this article last means I took the least from it. And so that's the article. It starts with a long quote. Don't care about the quote, but the guy, Huntington. That, that scholar from the 1990s was one of the people who talked the most about Confucianism's impact on democracy. And this paper is questioning that. And the other paper that I didn't get to yet questions that and says, is that really so? So I'm just going to read uh, one paragraph. You don't have to write it down, just for your background. And it's actually something I mentioned in an earlier class. South Koreans seem dissatisfied by their democratic governments. Post-democratization policies, that means since 1988, policies in South Korea <clears throat> have suffered from a loss in confidence in government, shrinking individual rights and freedoms, a perception of political corruption, and widening political polarization. Now we see political polarization all around the world. Less and less do people think we share ideas and more and more it's like, my side, no, my side. In the US, right? the Republican party is getting more conservative. The Democrat party is getting more liberal in general. There's not that many people comfortable sitting in the middle. Now that doesn't mean they're all that way, but it means overall society is moving more left and more right. In Korea, the same story. There's less and less middle ground. People are taking stronger positions on the yes or the no side. Post-democratization politics. That will be the last almost half of our class. Focusing on since 1988. Maybe a little before that, but not much. Okay. Procedurally, in 
in how things work and how laws are passed and the way things are done, South Korea is a functioning consolidated democracy. On paper and the way laws pass, government works well. Government works the way people think democracy should work. Citizens vote. They elect a legislature. They elect a president or mayor. And those people have a job and they do their job. And when their time is up, people vote again. The system looks like it works. It is a functioning, consolidated democracy, at least in procedure. But substantially, meaning the outputs, what we can see at the end of the day, it is still a state of democratic underdevelopment. That's a Westerner's view saying, well, the president's taking too much power. The legislature doesn't have all the power that they're supposed to have. The courts don't have all the power they're supposed to have. So that's one um, study that is based on collection of survey data, asking people what they think about this and this and this, and quantifying and measuring the data. Uh, and th that paper is not really worth more information. The third paper, the last thing for today, let's see if I get it right. I don't want to that. No, you know what? I just told you the summary to the third paper, the sec not the second paper. The second paper is the Chung paper. That's why I said it looked wrong. So this paper actually has a little bit more to it. <clears throat> Huntington, who I mentioned, called Confucian democracy an oxymoron. Oxymoron means two things put together that cannot happen. It's impossible. Two ideas do not fit together. Uh, this is the one. One fifty six. One five. So one fifty six. My screen's too small. Yeah. All right, so for example, in Come on, it's pretty small. I can read it. Okay. Where is it? Because it's 154, not 156. I can't read it. I'm sorry. This should have been clearer, but it's I just can't read it. 150. 156. Wrong page. This is terrible. This is terrible. This is like the worst lecture you've ever had. I know. I've had them too. Here we go. For example, Huntington dubs, Huntington calls Confucian democracy an oxymoron because Confucian values authority over liberty, responsibility over rights, and state power over human rights. That's what he says. He's a famous Western scholar. But we heard in the first paper kind of the opposite. Yeah, there's authority, but there's responsibility by the leader, right? The senior has an obligation to pay for the juniors. The senior has the obligation to give good advice. So that's one of the challenges that many Asians have when Westerners talk about this. Now, the literature on Confucianism and democracy, including Asian values, fails to distinguish between political democracy and democracy in social relations. Mm. You two ladies are from Poland and your roommates 
Are you equal? Do you vote for things? There's only two of you, so it's kind of hard, right? There's not a third. If there was a third, you could say, well, two wins and one loses, right? But our social relationships and how we decide things and our political relationships are perhaps different. I, I picked that music because you're doing Let's let's turn off the light. No, it's not. Let's turn off the light. No, it's not. I'm going to go straight. Let's do that. So, some Asian scholars argue that the reason Westerners think Asian Confucianism makes democracy difficult is because, well, you don't really understand Confucianism and you don't really understand society and you're not making the differences. I'm not going to read this section because. It's pretty much what I told you at the beginning of class that I put on the board. Okay. Delegative democracy. It's circled on my page, but I already gave it to you. And now we're almost through. Next page is long, and that's pretty much it. Of special interest is this. Similarity between the O'Donnell's delegative democracy and Pai's discussion of Korean political culture. Now, Pai is one of uh, the West's most known scholars in terms of Korea. If I remember correctly, he's based at Yale, but I don't remember. Anyway, see, Basically, a collection of Pai's talk that shows how Koreans seem to be following, following a delegative democracy model that they give the president a lot of power. Right? The president is the embodiment of the nation and the main custodian definer of its interests. That makes him a king. That's how we define king. The king is the country. Some English. King said that, or French French King said that once. Now I forget which language I heard it in. No. The state, that's me. The state, the country, the government, that's me. I, the king, I am the government. So at the bottom we see this phrase, illiberal or communicative communitarian democracy. The, the reason I point this out is because Korea's constitution says, defines this country is a liberal democracy. That is the exact words in the constitution written in Korean, I forget the words, but that's the perfect translation, liberal democracy. What does that mean? Ask a political scientist, they'll tell you. But the argument here is that communitarian democracy is illiberal. It doesn't meet the definition of liberal democracy. By the way, liberal democracy pushes for the power of businesses to do business. What's good for business is good for society. So liberalism is not the only backdrop to political democracy. It's replaceable. We could have liberal democracy or we could have illiberal democracy. It's still democracy. Having a strong president doesn't mean the country's not a democracy. We said that in the first class, right? People vote, that means democracy. Republic means you have a representative, probably in a legislature. Democracy only means you vote. Maybe there's only one name on the ballot. It's still democracy. And if you look, I'm just turning pages because most of this paper is heavy duty statistics, which we don't need to do. But if we go to page, what's the page 170, which is basically the summary, we're going to find an interesting word that summarizes what we are doing in this class. I need to be on page 170. It's easier to read here. No statistics. Don't need that. 
This research, so this study, shows that Confucianism impedes quotidian democratic practices. Okay, so what is the meaning of quotidian? Anybody? Don't feel bad, I had to look it up. I mean, I've heard it in my life several times, but I never remember. It's not a common meaning. Quotidian simply means every day, common, what we would expect. Quotidian traffic. Every day I come to school, nine days out of 10, it's the same kind of contract, same kind of traffic on the street. That would be quotidian traffic. Okay. Quotidian dem democratic practices. The kind of democracy we expect, what's normal to me. So this study says Confucianism affects badly democracy the way we. Westerners normally think of it. Now, the, the writer is a Korean educated in the United States, working in Korea, but educated in the United States. So they're coming from that US education of what is democracy. So Confucianism does impact it, but impact doesn't mean it breaks it. Emphasis on hierarchies does not favor democracy in social relations. But still, anyways, this Confucian tradition doesn't always inevitably clash with democracy. Democracy can work, it just means we have to find some ways to work around. And things like modernization, urbanization, cities, Protestantism, clearly shows that Confucianism doesn't have the power in society today that it had 50 years ago, 1970. My wife was born in 1960. I'm not allowed to say. But anyway, um, I was born in 1958, I can tell you. My wife was born in 1960s, early 60s. And she grew up in a small town. And when she finished high school, she still could not watch TV. There was no TV in the town. There was TV in Daegu, but it didn't go into the countryside. It didn't go into the, because of the mountains and stuff. You couldn't watch TV. So very much raised traditionally. Her two brothers who are younger than her are extremely traditional. They make me crazy. Because they're younger than her, but they're boys. So when we have a family event, the two sons decided. And they generally agree, but when they don't, eldest son wins. And yet my wife is older than either of them, and I'm older than my wife. But what I think doesn't count at all. I can either join or not. But I don't have a vote. I mean, in the earliest stages, people might talk about it and the wives talk about it. But finally, number one son is going to make the decision. And that's the way it is, welcome to Korea. That's what we mean by social democracy. But political democracy, he has a vote and I have a vote, right? I can't vote for president because I'm not a citizen, but I can vote for the mayor of the town and he can vote for the mayor of the town and we have the same rights. So social democracy and political democracy are different. So then he, he says, she says, I think this finding is significant. Basically, the finding here is that social democracy and political democracy are not the same thing. So we shouldn't be talking about them as they are. Okay, that's the focus for today background. Now, if you take a class on Taiwanese politics, you'll probably hear much of the same argument. Because Taiwan is still very Confucian. Uh, Singapore, much the same. I would say that in some respects, Singapore is Confucian. Singapore is a mess because it's for 
cultures that are separate that live together, but the Chinese are dominant. And as we read earlier, the former prime minister of Singapore is very much an Asian cultures, Asian democracies approach. You know, we need strong presidents. Uh, Malaysia uses the same argument, but Malaysia is not at all Confucian. They use the same argument, but they're not Confucian. Right? Malay are not. 97% uh, of the country are Muslim. 96, 97. Yeah. So, um, the theme for today. is the impact of culture. We primarily look at traditional culture. Because modern Korea, if you, if you, you know, it's, it's difficult right now because of coronavirus. And you cannot go out and do the things that could be done two years ago. You can't get a true feel for what society is like. You can't. Um, that's the other thing I was gonna talk about today for, for one minute. Um, but, Korea is very modern, you know? Every person you find on the street who is more than 10 years old and less than 70 years old, every person has a cell phone in their pocket or in their hand as they walk. Every person. And I think you can't get much more modern than that. Especially when you consider that Wi-Fi here is free in many places, and that data is relatively cheap here. Um, various studies say Korea is in the top five in terms of inexpensive price for a high level of data. Now you can get cheaper plans in some countries, but you guys all have a data plan? What do you pay? 30, 30, 30 more for cool. You got better than me. We're gonna talk, girl. <laughs> 30 for unlimited. No contract? Mm -hmm. Using your own phone. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk. Because <laughs> I don't need a data plan. I mean, I, mean, I don't need a, a plan because I, I had a contract that got paid for a long time ago and I just rolled it over when I, I got a new phone. I just stuck the SIM card in, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm paying 44 for uh, 2.3 gigs. Mm -hmm. It's actually unlimited. It's 2.3 gig at 4G, and after that, it's unlimited at 3G. And there's not very often I even want 4G, so it's not important to me. But, but 44, more than 30. So you did good. Got data plan? Yeah. Uh, does it have phone also? Phone and data? Yeah. What do you pay? <laughs> you haven't got a bill yet. Don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Prepaid cards. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the thing with prepaid cards is you don't have unlimited data. Data burns up, right? No, I would say we have unlimited data. Really? Yeah. Is that what you got? Uh, a prepaid card with unlimited data. Now, I haven't heard that one. Yeah, we're gonna have to look. Um, my, my. Anyway, uh, Korea is a modern society, especially the young people. Now, the very oldest people may not have a cell phone, or they may very well have it in their bag. My, my mother-in-law, she never checks her cell phone, uh, and she'll be out doing something, and it's ringing, ringing, ringing. She doesn't answer. She, she, her hearing's not that good, and she just doesn't pay attention. If, she, if she's on the phone, it's because she dialed it, because she wants me to come pick her up, right? Or something like that, right? Um, Anyway, so I would say that Korea is as modern as anywhere. And so the politics have changed from 30 years ago. Anyway, that's it. But the last thing I want to say for today is because of social distancing, you probably haven't. But has anybody gone out for a big Korean dinner that has like 20 dishes of food or more? See, this used to be something that we did. I mean, every semester, new students were invited to this big uh, banquet, basically kind of like uh, a royalty dinner or something like that. They call it jungshik. Jungshik has two meanings. One is like lunchtime meal, but several side dishes, which they call panchan. Uh, but also there's the kind of like the royal jungshik where you go out to dinner, there'll be 
probably 15 or more people, because otherwise the economics don't work. And on the table, there'll be like 20 different dishes of food, literally, plus rice. So, you know, there'll be the big fried fish, there'll be beef stewed one way and roasted another way, and there'll be pork, and there'll be chicken, and there'll be 19, um, there'll be nine different kinds of kimchi. And the point is that Chusuk time, often people would, in their family home, have a kind of a middle size with 10, maybe 12, maybe side dishes. And that's a kind of a glimpse of what is a more traditional Korea. But you can't really see that now. You can't go out to that kind of royal buffet. Uh, buffet doesn't mean self-serve buffet. It means it's kind of you know, long table. Um, so you don't really get a chance to experience that traditional Korea. Nowadays, you go down to the downtown area, and what do you see? You see uh, Paris Baguette and Burger King. And <laughs> Doesn't feel right. Anyway, Korea is very modern. Politics are changing. Traditional Korean is still there. If you're very lucky someday when you're traveling uh, out that way, across the bridge, not going towards downtown, but going out that way, across the bridge, it's a bit more rural. You might so find somebody with a pig's head, the head of a pig, in front of a car, with the car lights on, and they're bound. This would be some of the shamanism. This is the idea that uh, for a new car, it might not even be brand new, but it's new to me, in order to make sure that it's safe, we want the gods to bless the car. This could be a good Christian or a good Catholic or a good Buddhist, but they will still do this because that part of Confucianism is still at an Confucianism and shamanism, because it's not really Confucian, but uh, this, these various aspects of traditional Korea are still in almost everybody. Even if they don't really believe it, don't take a chance. When I bought my new apartment, my wife went in and dropped a block of salt in the middle of the apartment. We turned around, we walked out, came back the next day. Because salt is supposed to drive out the demons that might be in the apartment. And I was just I didn't laugh because that would be too rude, but inside I was just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is just too crazy. But why take a chance? So that level of traditionalism is still very much alive in Korea. So traditional and modern, and that affects politics. Anything else? Any questions for today? We do have class on Thursday. We will have a recording for next week, Thursday. You don't have to come to school. Uh, during Chusuk time, the library is probably open. The individual buildings, they probably won't let you come in. Don't plan to come into a building. Um, unless some professor has organized some program, the, the, the doors are technically open. Professors can go into their offices, but they don't want students in the building. So the campus is basically closed, but the library is probably open every day, but maybe short hours. So if you can find a chance to do something, do something. Yeah, today was long, boring, and, and a little bit disorganized, but it gets better. Sorry. Thank you very much. Take care. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, we're all here, except for the one. Thank you. Please type goodbye in the cookout. In goodbye, the in Professor. Yeah. Turn on the air conditioner. Oh,